All right. Um, well, everybody, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, we, like I said, we are live from the Constitution Center and uh, from Colonial Williamsburg and uh, Independence Mall in Philadelphia. And I have a very special guest to kick things off, father of the Constitution himself, James Madison. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Constitution Day. My name is James Madison, the fourth president of the United States and what some would call the father of the Constitution. I am excessively pleased and honored to address you, the good people of Philadelphia, people throughout the country from Colonial Williamsburg. 234 years ago today, a document was signed that continues to question us, to challenge us, and to inspire us. The summer of 1787 brought great debates and compromises that led to a great document that continues throughout now to oversee those various liberties that come from nature. I'm pleased upon this occasion to see so many bright young people join us as we discuss the various debates that took part and took place over the course of the convention, as well as to discuss how the Constitution has prevailed against all opposition, all the various challenges that history could bring forward, and from there, create a true government for the people and by the people. I am very pleased that the Center for the Constitution continues to speak of constitutional matters to people of all ages, not just today, but every day. And with that, it is my great privilege to introduce a dear friend and the CEO of the Constitution Center, Jeff Rawson. Thank you so much, Mr. Madison, and happy Constitution Day. It is so wonderful to be with you and to celebrate the anniversary of our Constitution. Friends, I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. We always begin our convenings here at the NCC by reciting together the charter that came from Congress because uh, it gets us excited about the learning that is ahead of us today. So here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis among the American people. Uh, Mr. Madison, before I let you go, we had such a great discussion on our Constitution 101 class last year. And I want to ask you, what's the one thing about the U.S. Constitution that you want all of our friends to know on Constitution Day? All right, thank you, Mr. Rosen. If there is one singular idea that can be distilled from the Constitution, not only the powers it grants a government, but the measures by which it allows a government to move is that it is a document that is meant to endure through the ages. Now, those who study government will know that a system of government begins to die almost as soon as it is born. The deterioration of it begins with the decay of its principles. And yet the true wonder, I will even say the true miracle of our constitution is that it is a distillation not of one time and not of one people, but of the whole collection of human history and the study of how a system deriving its energy from the will of society can endure. The Constitution of the United States is the culmination of all history of popular governments, and its success may be found in the example that it has survived through the better part of these two centuries. So beautifully put, and it's remarkable, isn't it? The longest surviving written constitution in human history, as well as the greatest document of human freedom ever written. Let me ask you, Mr. Madison, you were very concerned about the danger of mobs, and you saw Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts, where debtors were mobbing the courthouses and refusing to pay their debts, and you wanted to create a constitution that would slow down deliberation so that reason could prevail over passion, and you defined faction in Federalist 10 as any group, either a majority or a minority, animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the public good. Tell us why you were so concerned about the rule of reason over passion and how you 
developed the Constitution to slow down deliberation so that reason would prevail. Well, that is the great desideratum of government, Mr. Rosen, to ensure that a government can move through the will of society while still preventing a majority from encroaching upon the rights of the minority. We might say that such democratic values are the purest motion of government, and yet still, as I have often written, if every citizen of Athens were a Socrates, it still would have ended as a mob. So how then do you ingrain a system of government with such democratic principles while still prevailing upon reason, and as you said, not upon passion? Now in that, you cannot prevent faction. No, in doing so, you find a, well, a greater evil in the cure than from you find in faction itself. And so instead, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. You make one faction a check to another, and in doing so, you do not overleap the far greater barrier, which are, of course, the rights of the American people. Uh, Montesquieu gave forward a great education. He lifted the veil upon a great many of these political precepts and put forward the notion of the separation of powers within the branches of government. Our system of federalism, while inspired by Montesquieu, expanded upon these various ideas, not only placing checks and balances amongst the three tripartite branches of government, but also in the House of Delegates and the Senate, also within the state legislature as well as the federal legislature, but also in the midst of whatever factions that were defined within my time of 17 and 87, but just as equally in your time of 2021. So well put. Um, so our friends and who are saying hi in the chat from all over the country, and it's so exciting to see all of you. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Helen. Um, uh, just great to see all that coming in. Um, some folks wanted to, uh, just to review what you just said, which is so important. So Mr. Madison just reminded us that he said in Federalist 55, which is the papers that he wrote to defend the Constitution, in all large groups, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. So he told us when really big groups get together, they can get all excited and do irrational things. But Mr. Madison came up with a, a brilliant idea, which was representation. When we have representatives who are deliberating in our name, they can kind of slow things down, look at all the evidence and make good decisions based on reason rather than passion. And he also said in a really big country like America, it'd be hard for mobs to gather because it's so big, they, by the time they found each other, they'd get tired and go home. Now, Stephanie Herman in our chat says, how are we gonna solve the problems that are currently happening? And, and obviously one of the big problems, Mr. Madison, is social media and Twitter. And nowadays, when information travels so fast, it's easy for mobs to find each other. And your hope that enlightened journalists and representatives would allow reason slowly to spread across the land through the new medium of newspapers seems kind of idealistic in the age of Facebook. So I know I'm asking you to do a, do, do a lot, but um, to answer Stephanie's questions, uh, what, what, what do you make of the age of Twitter and, and what, what should our constitution do to address the problem of uh, mobs online? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Rosen, uh, if I'm to understand correctly, because some of those words are somewhat uh, foreign to me, am I to understand that within your age, without leaving the study, the closet, the room in which you occupy, you might, in an instance, speak with people of a continent away, share uh, the simultaneous ideas, uh, put forward ideas with, a, with an immediacy that does not exist within my time? Exactly right. You thought news would travel really slowly, and today it's traveling at light speed. Within seconds, people, as we're speaking, are tweeting out what you're saying and what I'm saying, and how do we guarantee slow deliberation in this new media environment? What a holy remarkable opportunity exists therein. You, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I have often said that within my age, 
the diffusion of the printed word places us in the most enlightened age that has ever heretofore existed. After all, when the time came to prepare for that convention, for the business in Philadelphia in 1787, I held myself away within my father's library at my family's estate and pulled through thousands of years of history. I traveled the world without uh, leaving my chair. But to understand that in your time, you are faced with a, a far more unique opportunity is, is overwhelming to consider that at your fingertips is not only correspondence and information from throughout the country, but well, the whole history of the world. Now, it is true that within this vein, there is the great risk of emotion ruling that uh, truth being difficult to find. Uh, so populus disipi, disipiator, if a people wish to be deceived, they will be deceived. And yet I have often found that truth is ever lurking amongst that collection of passions. And it is the great responsibility, nay, I, I should say the great obligation of a people to be enlightened, to derive themselves from those great charters, not from uh, the power of kings, but rather instead the legitimate power of the people. Now here comes, well, the, the great dilemma, but I will put forward just as equally the far greater opportunity. Now consider what is at your fingertips amongst this age that you say that you live in. Yes, you might speak with people a continent away. Yes, passion might move you immediately, but consider if you move with reason, what things throughout the course of human history might you have access to? Now, I have cited already over the course of our time together Montesquieu. I have spoken of the history of the Athenians. I have no doubt over the course of our time together, we will cite a great many of the philosophers that inspired the Constitution. Now, consider in your time the wondrous opportunity that exists where, by simply uh, the motion of a cursor, you might for yourself have equal access to all of this collected human history, to enlighten yourself, to pursue the truth. Consider how the whole of human history has been robbed of that unique opportunity. Uh, consider then the debt that you owe to them to enlighten yourself and consider above all how very fortunate that the family of man should not be severed as they have previously done by this geographical distinction, but that for the first time in human history, we might collectively all come together into a, a far larger family. Well, consider this, Mr. Rosen. Uh, I am in the old colonial capital of Williamsburg, Virginia, you in Philadelphia, and yet here we are at this present moment be able to correspond the one with the other. Is this not the most wondrous opportunity to find not only a common ground that heretofore we could not be afforded, but simultaneously to understand the truth with much greater immediacy? Beautifully put, Mr. Madison. I entirely share your wonder at the fact that all of the knowledge of the world is found online and our friends who are watching us from around the country can listen to our discussion now, can hear the incredible programs that we're going to be sponsoring all day at the National Constitution Center, and then can go online and can continue your learning. And friends, this is what uh, Mr. Madison and I want you to take away from our discussion right now. The fountain of wisdom flows through books and all of the books of the world you can find for free and online to learn and grow. We're going to put a lot of them online at the NCC in a new Founders Library, all the great texts of American history from the beginning all the way through the civil rights era and today. And right now, you can go on to the Constitution Center's interactive constitution and pick any amendment and you'll find podcasts and th th scholars of different perspectives and Constitution 101 classes. All, there's everything you need for a lifetime of learning. All you've got to do is take the time to do it. And that's on you. Set aside some time at home or in school and uh, don't just browse and surf, but 
dig in and read and learn and grow in wisdom. And you have the ability to do just what Mr. Madison said, which is cultivate your faculties of reason so you can fulfill the founders' hopes that you would be able to pursue happiness. So that's what Constitution Day is about. It's so exciting to share this conversation with you and Mr. Madison, um, and so excited to uh, tell you about all the programs that are coming up today. So here's a quick preview, and I tune in for whatever you can uh, have time for. Uh, we have coming up at noon, right after this program, a conversation about the state of civics education in the U.S. Uh, with uh, Louise Dubay of iCivics, Saul Khan, who did all those great Khan Academy videos that some of you have used, and Dr. Dr. William Height from Philadelphia. We have an all-star Constitution 101 class at one o'clock with three phenomenal professors, Martha Jones, Hassan Kwame Jeffries, and Robbie George. If, if you have a constitutional question, these are the guys to answer it, and please join us for that. Then at two o'clock, we have th three of America's greatest appellate judges, uh, Judge Marjorie Rendell, Cheryl Ann Krauss, and Stephanos Bibas, about how they approach some of the most important cases on the Supreme Court docket last year, including Mahoney versus BL. That was the case involving the school uh, free speech and that cheerleader who used curse words on Snapchat. And the question was, can she do that? And the Supreme Court unanimously said, yes, she can, because you have free speech rights in school. And these judges decided that case before it got to the Supreme Court, and they're going to tell us all about it. And then it's going to all culminate this evening in a conversation with one of America's greatest historians. His name is Gordon Wood. He's written this incredible new book, Power and Liberty, about the Constitution and the Revolution. He's going to be joined by Ed Larson, Emily Pierce, and Lucas Morell. Friends, if you tune in, I know you'll get as excited as American about American history as uh, James Madison and I are. And uh, you'll, uh, I hope you read Gordon Wood's book and learn from it. Okay, uh, Mr. Madison, I'm so grateful to you for having spread so much learning and light and inspired our students to learn and grow and look forward to our next conversation. Um, so I'm going to uh, thank you very sincerely. And uh, now I'm going to introduce a great friend of the National Constitution Center, uh, Cindy McLeod. She runs the National uh, Park Service. She's the superintendent of the National Historic Park District where the National Constitution Center sits uh, right across from Independence Hall where the Declaration and Constitution were written. Uh, Cindy McLeod, so grateful to you for your stewardship of these sacred American uh, spaces and uh, happy Constitution Day and, and please uh, say a few words to our students. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, students and teachers. I couldn't think of a better place to be than to be with you all celebrating the 234th anniversary, the signing of truly one of our most significant founding documents, the United States Constitution. As we've alluded, um, that act took place in Independence Hall. We know it now as Independence Hall. It's where I work. And you can see behind me a picture of the assembly room and the rising sun chair. That's a whole story in itself. Wow. It's hard to imagine what life was like before our constitution, isn't it? We can hardly remember. Sometimes I can't 10 years ago, but we do remember that we won our revolutionary war from England. And then we think, then what? It's instructive to study our first government structure under the Articles of Confederation and why the founders thought it needed revision. Principally among them, James Madison from Virginia, who was wonderful, he time traveled to be with us today. Our founders were looking out for a nation's interests, not just a loosely bound collection of states. Early in the summer of 1787, 1787 delegates from 13 states gathered in Philadelphia to figure it all out. Philadelphia was central. It was the biggest city in our young country. The delegates discussed their fundamental differences, addressing small state and large state issues and passionate concerns over balance of powers. I said disgust, but it was fierce. Finally, after a hundred days of hot debate, it was also really warm that summer, they reached agreement. On September 17th, they signed a four-page document 
only four pages. It didn't yet have what we know as the Bill of Rights, an omission that offended many and which was added three years later. With the 1787 Constitution, a new form of government was established for our young nation. A government, as you heard, that strengthened the federal power, separated all powers for checks and balances reasons, and stated the basic premise of the power of the people, from which our current understanding of civil rights has grown. Words like we the people from 1787 and the updated version of the phrase, we could say civil rights, are especially meaningful these days and have been at the forefront of the National Park Service and Independence National Historical Park, where we welcome visitors to witness to the witness sites, even during this pandemic. We also have lots of programs going on online. It's nps.gov backslash INDE. In times where travel is difficult, I invite you to go to that website and to the overall National Park Service website, nps.gov. The National Park Service has more than 25 specifically civil rights themed sites, ranging from Harper's Ferry, where John Brown made his stand against slavery, to the Cesar Chavez National Memorial to the labor leader, to the National Mall where Martin Luther King Jr. spoke during the March on Washington, to the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail, 54 miles to freedom, where Congressman Lewis and other leaders led peaceful demonstrators to demonstrate the need for full voting rights. So as superintendent in charge of Independence Hall, I think I can say that Independence Hall is the mother of all our civil rights sites. <clears throat> where our nation's founder get, founders gathered to plan a path separate from England, forward to freedom and liberty, and where people today exercise their First Amendment rights. As I said, it's where the, Con the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution were debated, adopted, and signed. We know that in 1787, only propertied white men were in the room, but they wrote a document that allowed others in. So please check out all the stories of liberty, equality, and justice at the National Constitution Center, our great partner in this effort, and in many of the National Park Service sites and on our website, nps.gov. Thank you and happy Constitution Day. Thank you so much, Cindy. What an inspiring speech and how inspiring to see you in Independence Hall in front of the Rising Sun Chair it's incredibly meaningful to be able to actually visit these great buildings again, uh, just as it is to see Mr. Madison in Colonial Williamsburg. It's, it's wonderful that the internet can bring us together. And friends, uh, Cindy McLeod talked about the Rising Sun Chair, and I bet a lot of you know the story, um, which is that at the end of the convention, Ben Franklin said he'd seen the sun on the back of George Washington's chair throughout the convention, and he wasn't sure if it was a rising or a setting sun, but after the uh, Constitution was adopted, he had the confidence and optimism to understand the sun was rising. And that is the spirit of today. We have many challenges ahead, but we remain uh, positive and optimistic and united by our shared devotion to the ideals of the Declaration and the Constitution. So, Cindy, thank you so much. And thanks for a great. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Great to be with you. OK, now it is time for the reading of the preamble. This is just so inspiring, friends. Um, they are the words that unite and inspire us today. You can view the words on the interactive constitution, and I'm going to call it uh, up if I can, or, or Jenna, do you want to share it on the screen so we can read it together? Here we go. Beautiful. Okay, this is the interactive constitution, and um, just as you get ready to read, I'm going to tell you a story and then we're going to read the words. But why do we begin with the words, we the people of the United States? Well, the first draft of the Constitution, which we have at the Constitution Center, had the words, we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Rhode Island and Providence Plantation and so forth. It was changed to we the people of the United States to signal the belief of the framers, in particular, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, that we the people of the entire United States have the power. We are the sovereign power, not the state governments are not sovereign, 
The president isn't sovereign. We don't have a king in America. Congress doesn't have the sovereign authority. We, the people of the whole United States, do. It's because we are endowed by our creator with unalienable rights. And we surrender control over some of those rights to get greater security of the rights we've retained. We have government by consent. And from that flows the rule of law and popular sovereignty. And it's all contained in those beautiful words, we the people, which are the essence, the essential contribution of the framers to uh, freedom. Um, okay, here we go. Um, rec recite along with me and let's do it with feeling. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Beautifully done. Isn't that inspiring, friends? It's just wonderful um, to hear the words and to reflect on what they mean and to learn about them. And I wish you a lifetime of learning and growth about the Constitution and American history and about the ideals which define who we are as Americans. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to our education team to kick off our Kids Town Hall. Enjoy Thanks. the show and have a Thanks. wonderful Constitution Day. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Cindy. Happy Constitution Day, everyone. Bye. Uh, as I mentioned, Jeff, uh, we are live at the Constitution Center. And so in addition to Mr. Madison, we have some wonderful historic figures with us um, at the Constitution Center right now. Um, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Brian uh, to, uh, you know, uh, ask some questions of our uh, of our fellow um historic figures at the at the center. So Brian, hi, how are you? I'm good, Jenna. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, those of you who are here in person at the National Constitution Center, as well as those who are joining us online. Uh, we're doing our town hall where we have several figures from American history who are able to talk to us about the uh, meaning of the Constitution and its significance. Uh, here beside me, we have uh, abolitionist, activist, and suffragist Frances Harper. We have icon of the early American Republic and signer of the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin, and the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. And each of them are able to tell us a bit about the significance of the Constitution in their own time and perhaps some of their dreams for the Constitution of the United States. And I know, I believe our friend, Mr. Madison, father of the Constitution is still joining us. Is that right, Jenna? Oops, sorry, Brian. Yes. What was the question? Mr. Madison is still joining us as well, right? Yes, he, he's uh, still here with us. He's on, oh. he's on the Zoom. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Now, I have a question I would like to put to all of our figures here and give us each an opportunity to answer this one. I might make it a two-parter. I hope you don't mind. Uh, is I can begin with perhaps Mr. Madison joining us uh, via Zoom. Is What is one particular portion of the Constitution you are proud to have uh, ensured that is in the document or for uh, President Lincoln and for Ms. Harper, uh, perhaps a change to the Constitution that you saw that you were really satisfied with. And on the other hand, something that you had hoped to see in your own time, uh, a change to the Constitution, an idea about we the people or the provisions within our government. Uh, Mr. Madison, would you be able to answer that for us? Mr. Madison, you are muted. Uh, why don't we, oh, I, I don't think he knows he's muted. Brian, why don't we start with, I know because we, Jeff already kicked us off with Mr. Madison. So while we um, do his, uh, uh, figure out his audio issues, why don't we start with our other reenactors? Because we haven't heard from him, them at all yet. Ms. Harper, would you like to get us started with, say, uh, perhaps a change to the Constitution or something of that era that you were really happy to see and then something you would have loved to see uh, in a later age. Yes, th thank you, and good day, everyone. My name is 
Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. I uh, was born free, actually, in 1825 in Baltimore, Maryland. And I ended my life uh, here and lived for many, many years in Philadelphia. I actually owned a home in 1870 Bainbridge Street here in Philadelphia. As it relates to the Constitution and we the people, as a woman of color and as a woman, there were actually several amendments to the Constitution that really impacted my life. As I stated, I was born free, but many, most African American or people of color were not free. And so the 13th Amendment, which emancipated and ended slavery in this country, was one of the most powerful amendments to the Constitution that impacted my life. I had spent many years working as an abolitionist to bring an end to the cruelty of slavery. But also, as I stated, as a woman, women did not really have the same rights and privileges, young ladies and young men, that we have now in our modern times. So for me, what I would have liked to have seen in my lifetime would have been women to be seen as an equal to men. Men and women are all equal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Harper. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful thoughts. Now, Dr. Franklin, you were in the room with Mr. Madison I when was, crafting and signing the document. Yeah. Uh, is there anything, perhaps, that you felt the Constitution was lacking or you would have liked to see? Oh, certainly. Uh, many things. Um, first of all, uh, you, uh, you asked, uh, you referred to, uh, pardon me, um, you referred to something that, that I liked about the Constitution. And uh, what I like most about the Constitution, well, there are two things. I like the fact that it's short uh, because it, it, it's, it's fewer than 5,000 words. Uh, and so it, it not, we did not try to address everything specifically that would have gone on forever, and I don't think we'd have ever gotten it done. Um, but it, it is, gives us uh, the framework to, to address problems as they appear. The other thing is that it can be changed, and I am so happy to hear things that do not happen in my lifetime that I had hoped would happen when we wrote this Constitution. I had hoped, first of all, that we would address the issue of slavery. Uh, to my death, I will write letters to Congress addressing it. Uh, and, but, uh, but, you know, what happened was we had to have nine states approve this, and slavery was everywhere. And so it couldn't happen. But I was happy that we could walk away feeling that we had at least made ourselves one strong country and had a, a mechanism to address things like, uh, like uh, anti-slavery issues like uh, voting for women, uh, all of these things that, that we knew should happen. But uh, I, I saw that, that things would, people would not see things the same way they, that we saw our, in our time. And the idea that when people came along with more enlightened ideas, that these things could be changed, these, um, these made me at least feel like that we had not uh, walked away with nothing. OK. Thank you so much, Dr. Franklin. Now, President Lincoln, you lived certainly in a tumultuous era, but perhaps there's a change to the Constitution in your time that you were particularly proud of or satisfied with, and maybe something you would have liked to have seen happen in your own age. Well. We had to get off that perch. Now, during my administration, of course, as you know, we were engaged in a great civil war mm. over uh, the uh, condition of slavery. Now, the Constitution, which I admire, and all of the founding documents, uh, the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights neglected to address the problem of slavery in this country for reasons that the founding fathers will have to explain by the time I came along, I was at least able to introduce what you know as the Emancipation Proclamation, but it wasn't a complete 
document. It only freed slaves that were residing in territories and states that were in rebellion against the federal government. It didn't free any slaves in the border states, didn't free any slaves in Delaware. And it was vulnerable to being overturned in court once the war was concluded. So we needed something to patch the cracks and fill in the holes of that document. And so I advocated for the passage of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, which would declare slavery illegal in this country. Now, it was passed by the Senate in April of 1864, but it failed in the House. And we had to put our noses to the grindstone and arrange things. And finally, on the 31st of January in 1865, the 13th Amendment was uh, approved by the House. Then it was uh, introduced to the ratification process, which took until December of 1865 to ratify and declare that uh, amendment the law of the land. That I am most proud of. There are many other laws I would like to see enacted to guarantee the freedoms of all people. Uh, freedom for women for suffrage, freedom for, well, you, you pick a freedom and I'm in favor of it. And uh, I'm uh, hopeful that someday the Constitution will guarantee all the rights of all the people in this country. So that's my connection to the Constitution and I was grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. Ryan, I think, uh, I think James Madison has his audio back and I think um, we can take an online question for him. Uh, Mr. Madison, one of the questions that came in online was, um, do you think that the vision of the preamble that you wrote in 1787 has been um, fulfilled? And do you think the Constitution does a good job fulfilling that, that vision? Uh, I thank you uh, for the question. Uh, my apologies for being difficult to hear. I am notoriously soft-spoken by nature. Uh, I'm excessively pleased uh, to keep company with this august assembly and to speak with all of you. Uh, the words of our preamble, uh, very similar uh, to the words of our Declaration of Independence, are at their first a promise, uh, the realization of all collective wisdom of the art of government. Now, whether we have secured the blessings of liberty for today remains to be seen, but it is not only for ourselves that we are securing these liberties, but equally for our posterity, for those who come after. Now, just as we, the living, hold a debt against those who have come before to honor these various ideas, so too, do we owe a debt to those who will come after, to future generations, to be the stewards of these sacred and undeniable ideas, to pass them to the next generations? Now, in that, it is my estimation, it is my belief, that the work of our preamble, just as the work of our Declaration of Independence, will not be completed in our time, will not be completed in any time. After all, we are not set out to forge a perfect government, but with every day that passes, with every word that is spoken, with everything we do, we must labor to craft a more perfect union. And that estimation, this American experiment, will never be done. And how lucky we are for that. Thank you, that was such a wonderful response. We are getting some more questions in and um, for our uh, audience online, we will have to wrap shortly. Um, the audience in the room can stay in the room with our, with our other panelists. Um, uh, questions about how to, um, how to change the constitution and that, um, Mr. Madison, I'll give that to you. We do have a process for how to change the constitution, right? And we've done that a couple times. I don't think well, Madison caught that, Jenna. Uh, but perhaps Dr. Franklin, yes. do you think you may be able to answer that yeah. question uh, for the us? The question was about the process of, of amending the Constitution. Oh, the yes. uh, process of amending the Constitution. Uh, the fact, I said uh, uh, that I liked the Constitution because it was short, and that, that the other reason I liked it was because it can be changed. Now, it can be changed, but uh, as Mr. Madison referred to, I believe in that, that battle between reason and passion. 
Uh, we didn't make it so it could be changed every day whenever we felt like it. Uh, we, we made it so that it could be changed, but it had to go through a process and a, a, a long pro involved process, but something that would, that would cause people to think about it and give them a chance to assess really the, the, the good things and the bad things about a possible change. And so it has to be a, approved uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, the, all of the states eventually meeting in their, uh, in their, either in their conventions or by Congress and ratified by the people. But uh, so it has, it's a long involved process, but it has happened. I, I am saddened to hear that it took 13 amendments to, to free uh, uh, our, our slaves. Uh, and uh, I wish that it could have happened sooner, but people uh, were not thinking right yet. Um, but uh, so it, it can be changed, but it can't be changed quickly. Uh, it, it can't just say you don't wake up in the morning and say, all right, let's change this. I don't like it. Um, and when you haven't really thought it out. Um, so it, it's like all of the Constitution. It doesn't please everyone because nothing will ever please everyone. But we work toward uh, getting, things, getting things right for everyone. Um, oh, I want to say one thing else. When I've had people come up to me and say, Dr. Franklin, thank you for our Constitution. I want to remind you all that we did not give this Constitution to you as a gift. We gave it to you as a job. Someone asked me, what kind of government have you given us? I said, a republic, if you can keep it. Your job, the one we've passed on to you, is to keep on keeping it. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's a perfect, I do think that's a perfect note because um, for those of us, uh, for those of you watching online, we do have to wrap up because we do have another Zoom coming up at noon. So we do have to wrap up online. So we want to thank Mr. Madison for joining us all the way from Virginia. And of course, our um, Philadelphia contingent at the National Constitution Center. Those of you in the room, um, I, you can still uh, ask um, our, our friends some questions. But those of you online, thank you for joining us and have a very happy Constitution Day. And happy Constitution Day to you, Mr. Madison. Good day to you.